Good afternoon, students. Today's lesson would be the last lesson by Alphonse Daudet. Uh, before we start off with the chapter, there are certain things, certain key aspects which we need to remember. I'll divide the lesson into three halves. First, it would be a brief idea about uh, the background of the story, supposing as in the backdrop and what context was the story written. The second half would be the reading and explanation and uh, I'll try to wrap up my lecture by giving you a brief roundup of the key concepts which we have come across. So, and before we start off, just a, uh, a brief note of uh, advice to you. Try to follow the class lecture and when you go home and uh, you listen to it, please refer to the text, read the text very carefully and then this lecture will perhaps be of good benefit to you. Without further ado, let's just start off with our lesson. That's the last lesson by Alphonse Dada. Ironically, <laughs> this is the first lesson of your English syllabus, but it's named the last lesson. Before we start off, some key concepts to remember. Number one, linguistic chauvinism. Number two, cultural education. Now, I'll start off with the first uh, topic, linguistic chauvinism. There are instances of uh, a group of people who take unnecessary pride in their own language, in their own culture. What do they do is they try to disregard other languages and demean other cultures. That's the biggest problem that we are facing. There are so many examples, like in a country like India, it's a composite culture. We find people speaking various languages and in a way, language becomes the most definitive index of a nation's culture. So there are races, there are communities who try to preserve their identity through the extensive use of their own language. In this regard, let's just talk about the importance of the mother tongue. For us, the Bengalis, we are a community, we speak Bengali, for the Punjabis, they speak their own, and so on and so forth. There are so many communities, so many different sects, so many different races, speaking their different languages. But the problem arises when one such community tries to extend one's pride of, of their culture, their ego, or their language, and tries to disregard the very existence of others. This very aspect is called linguistic chauvinism. The way we try to assert, the way we try to exert our influence over others and in the process try to demean them. Now, this leads to so many other problems. The text at hand will talk about how one race, that's the French people, how they get dominated, how they get subjugated and the native people are deprived of their very right to express themselves in their vernacular, in their native language. In this context, let's just talk about the backdrop or the background of the story. It is set against the Franco-Prussian War, which took place in 1870s. Prussian army comprising of the German Poland and Austrian forces, they forcibly annexed some part of France. They attacked France and some of the districts came under their direct control. In the story at hand, the two such districts are Alsace and Lorraine. 
these two districts come under direct German authority, German control. There's a typical sentiment of the colonizer which is at work over here. What is the first thing that the colonizer does? It's not, it's not just about annexing a part of kingdom and uh, trying to assert their own authority and imposing themselves on the natives. It basically starts by annexing the kingdom or the estate. And it gradually moves on to coercion. The students, the meaning of coercion is force, implying force. What they try to do is they try to implement their set of rules, their set of regulations. And the most traumatic and the most psychologically damaging aspect of this is they try to take away the language of the natives. So, depriving the natives of their native language. This is the harshest form of punishment which could be inflicted upon the people. The colonized race, the ones who are conquered, the ones who are vanquished, they're helpless, they're, they're hapless. And imagine a situation where you all are not allowed to express yourselves in your own native language, in your own vernacular, which you feel free. So in that case, there is an instance of linguistic chauvinism. The Germans who conquered the parts of France, they imposed a ban on the use of French language. The first thing that they did was issue an order which would stop, prohibit teaching of the French language in the schools of France. In a way, it's detrimental to the psyche of the French people. You are not allowed to express yourself in the most natural form of expression. This deals with linguistic chauvinism. The second concept that we're talking about is cultural subjugation. And the linguistic chauvinism is a means of exerting, or, or rather, is a means to achieving this end. The Germans, what they did was, in an attempt to prove themselves superior, they were the master race and they were the conquerors. So what did they do? They tried to take away the culture of the native French people. The means to do that was prevent them, stop them from using their native tongue. The lesser they use their own native language, the lesser they are, they are in contact with their own roots, with their own cultural identity, with their own uh, identity as a nation. So in that way, if it continues for a prolonged period, the coercion comes into play and you start losing your identity as a nation. So your national identity is at stake. That creates another problem. So having talked about these two key concepts, linguistic chauvinism and cultural subjugation, let's just move on to the text. Uh, the last lesson by Alfonso Dodin, I will read out the extracts and then go about explaining them as here. So here it goes. I started for school very late that morning and was in great dread of a scolding, especially because M. Hamill had said that he would question us on participles, and I did not know the first word about them. For a moment, I thought of running away and spending the day out of doors. It was so warm, so bright. 
The birds were chirping at the edge of the woods. And in the open field, back of the sawmill, the Prussian soldiers were drilling. It was all much more tempting than the rule of participles. But I had the strength to resist and hurried off to school. In the first portion itself, in the first paragraph itself, the protagonist, that is Franz, a little boy residing in France, he expresses his reluctance to go to school. Now, as a child, it is quite natural to be diverted, to be distracted by all the beauties at available. And therefore, Franz himself also is not willing to go to school. He, he prefers to, uh, to take a view of the nature, to take a view of the Prussian soldiers drilling. These sites seem to be more exciting, more fascinating than the prospect of going to school and M. Hamel, the French teacher, would be taking a lesson on participles. So the students were expected to come prepared and he would ask them the questions. That was the task which Franz is not willing to undertake. So he hurried off to school. When I passed the town hall, there was a crowd in front of the bulletin board. For the last two years, all our bad news had come from there. The lost battles, the draft, the board orders of the commanding officer. And I thought to myself, without stopping, what can be the matter now? A very, very important piece of information is being given in these lines. Students, it's better to mark this section. The importance of the bulletin board and the duration for which France was under German authority. It says for the last two years, all the bad news had come from the bulletin board, which means the orders issued by the authority, they were all placed, they were all put up on the bulletin board for the benefit of the French people. And it was not pleasant at all. But the order of the commanding officer, the drafts, the lost battles, they do not speak of anything pleasant. Now there is an idea of conscription that is being talked about over here. Conscription, which means you are enlisted for mandatory service of the state. And even married men, young children, young boys, sorry, they were forced to take part and serve the state. In this case, it's the army. So this is, this does not read, this not, does not make a very pleasant reading, but a very pleasant story for the people of France. They have been suffering from the atrocity for the last two years. Anything put up on the bulletin board would mean something drastic, something terrible for the French people. Same thing happens now. France believes that it's something worse this time around. That piques his curiosity. He becomes curious to know what has taken place. Then, as I hurried by as fast as I could go, the blacksmith walked her, who was there with his apprentice reading the bulletin, called after me. Don't go so fast, bub. You'll get to your school in plenty of time. I thought he was making fun of me and reached M. Hamel's little garden all out of breath. Now there, this man out of jest that told Franz that you don't need to hurry in order to go to your school. Franz took it otherwise. He thought he was being mocked. He was being ridiculed. And the reason why he hurries to school is, at the back of his mind, he knows very well how strict the teacher is. M. Hamel, therefore, even before appearing to the picture, we definitely form a vague idea of this man, how strict this man might be. So he runs and arrives at M. Hamel's little garden all out of breath. Usually, when school began, there was a great bustle which could be heard out in the street, the opening and closing of desks, lessons repeated in unison, very loud with our hands over our ears to understand better, and the teacher's great ruler rapping on the table. 
But now, it was all so still. I had counted on the com commotion to get to my desk without being seen. But of course, that day, everything had to be as quiet as Sunday morning. Children, please mark this section. There is something unusual about the entire atmosphere in the school. It's not the usual conundrum, hustle and bustle, the chaotic din, the, cha the commotion that we usually observe in a school classroom. On that particular day, it was unusually quiet. An eerie silence prevailed in the classroom. On other days, the commotion, the noise, which we used to prevail, it was absolutely lacking. And the author gives a nice comparison. It's like a Sunday morning. Sunday mornings are usually very calm and quiet because there is no trouble, there is no uh, rush to go to work People for the, for the people. So that kind of atmosphere prevails in the school classroom. Absolute silence. So this is the first odd thing which Franz observes. Summer one. Through the window, I saw my classmates already in their places. And M. Hamill walking up and down with his terrible iron ruler under his arm. I had to open the door and go in before everybody. You can imagine how I blushed and how frightened I was. The last section, how frightened I was. Franz is ashamed, number one, for having come late to school. He is scared for the teacher is very strict. He's carrying the iron ruler in his hand that immediately places M. Hamill and, and the image of M. Hamill as a strict disciplinarian, a very, very hard taskmaster. Someone is very strict, very particular about discipline, about punctuality and all other things. But surprisingly, Franz expects something, but gets quite the opposite in return. What? But nothing happened. M. Hamill saw me and said very kindly, go to your place quickly, little Franz. We were beginning without you. This was an exception. This is the second odd thing, the second uh, strange thing which Franz observed. The temperament of M. Hamill. He had expected the teacher to be very, very angry, very annoyed. But surprisingly, he remained very calm, very compassionate, very understanding, and quietly asked Franz to go and take his place. This was number two, the two observations, second observation. I jumped over the bench and sat down at my desk. Not till then, when I had got a little over my fright, did I see that our teacher had on his beautiful green coat, his frilled shirt, and the little black silk cap all embroidered that he never wore except on inspection and prize days. That's the third part. The attire of M. Hamill. He was dressed in his best attire. That's quite unusual. Only on occasions like prize days and inspection would be fine M. Hamill dressed in those attire, those pretty dresses. But Franz observes on this particular day, he is completely different as an individual. Is not like the old strict teacher. This was number three, children. Please mark this entire portion from teacher had on his beautiful green coat till inspection and prize days. Something different about the teacher in terms of his appearance. Okay, moving on. Besides, the whole school seemed so strange and solemn. But the thing that surprised me the most was to see on the back benches that, was, that were empty, the village people sitting quietly like ourselves. Old Hossa with his three-cornered hat, the former mayor, the former postmaster, and several others besides. This was also quite shocking for little Franz. Having seen his master in that attire, as if it was not enough. The second thing was the presence of 
the old people, the villagers, sitting at the back benches. This was a rarity. Rather, it had never happened before. The old people attending school in large numbers and filling up the last benches and sitting all quiet, listening to the lecture with rapt attention, flipping through the pages of their books, everybody with, uh, you know, with that intention, with that, with that uh, intensity, with that desire, that eagerness, that zeal to learn. This was quite surprising. So number four would be the presence of the old villagers in the last benches. And the fifth one, the most striking and the most relevant one, was the atmosphere of the class. Very solemn, very grave, and it was like an atmosphere of gloom. You could literally make it out from the expression on their faces. So, silent, very somber mood prevailed, gloomy atmosphere, and the presence of these five people, the quietness. Taken together, all these five relevant points, these would be essential for you to understand how the class on that particular day was different. It was a sharp departure from the usual, the conventional classes which M. Hamill took on other days. Something was amiss, something was different on this particular day. So we have got five different points. I hope all of you have marked these five points carefully. We proceed. Everybody looked sad. Please mark this part. Everybody looked sad and Horsa had brought an old primer thumbed at the edges and he held it open in his knees with his great spectacles lying across the pages. There's something important going on over here. The kind of eagerness, the kind of zeal these old people are showing towards learning. This is very important. Something to mark. <clears throat> While I was wondering about it all, M. Hamel mounted his chair and in the same grave and gentle tone which he had used to me, said, my children, this is the last lesson I shall give you. The order has come from Berlin to teach only German in the schools of Elsetz and Lorraine. The new master comes tomorrow. This is your last French lesson. I want you to be attentive. This announcement from M. Hamel came as a complete bombshell. It stunned the class, absolutely. The order has already come. So this makes it clear as to what was put up on the bulletin board on that particular day. Franz never went near to have a look and actually see what was written. Now we understand, this is the order. The Germans had already issued an order to stop teaching French in the schools and it's getting replaced by their own language, that is German. The German teacher is about to arrive the next day and this officially is the last class on French. You can well imagine the kind of impact the words of M. Hamel must have had on all the students present in the class. So we'll just take it up one by one. What a thunderclap these words were to me. Oh, the wretches, that was what they had put up at the town hall. Now this is the realization of Franz and he uses the word wretches. The Germans are wretched people. So, you know, through these expression, one thing is very clear. The deep-rooted hatred, the anger, the outrage which the French people possessed, which the French people developed for the Germans. Now the last, I mean, after this, we will talk about what was the impact on France. How did he get affected by the announcement of M. Hamel? My last French lesson. Why? I hardly knew how to write. I should never learn anymore. I must stop there then. Oh, how sorry I was for not learning my lessons, for seeking birds' eggs or going sliding on the sar. 
my books that had seemed such a nuisance a while ago, so heavy to carry, my grammar and my history of the saints were old friends now that I couldn't give up. And M. Hamill too, the idea that he was going away, that I should never see him again, made me forget all about his ruler and how cranky he was. Now students, please pay attention. There is a drastic change that has come over in France. The very announcement made by M. Hamill, it just triggers a set of reactions in France. Number one is the realization. It dawns upon him that this is going to be the last French lesson he will attend. After this, he will no longer have any opportunity to learn his language. Second, he feels guilty. Guilty for what? Guilty for having wasted his opportunity to learn French. When there was an opportunity, he just did not take it. He used the lost opportunity to learn French. And what he had done? He had indulged in childish pleasures, seeking birds, eggs, going out in the open, uh, you know, running about, everything but attend school, attend class. Now he's having to pay the price for all the uh, opportunity which he had lost. The books which he felt was, was very, uh, were very heavy to carry, the grammar, the history of saints, and so, other and so many other things, which he once thought to be as a burden, a very heavy burden to carry. Now all of a sudden, at this critical juncture, they appear to be his friends. And he feels there is a separation coming. There is a departure. Henceforth, he will no longer have any connection with these textbooks, with these books. It's more like a very intimate connection with a friend and that is getting severed, that is getting snapped. And the pain which one feels, friends at this point of time experiences that particular pain, that particular agony. Third, at the back of his mind, there is you know, some, some sort of uh, regret taking place. He's ashamed of his own conduct. Now that he realizes, he has no time to make amends for this. So even when M. Hamill was a very cranky, very strict man, and he had ruler in his hand, he, he, he practiced corporal punishment. But even those negative aspects seem to be downplayed by the very fact that he is not getting any more opportunity to learn his own language. Being a Frenchman, he does not know his native tongue, that is French. This was disgrace. This was of great humiliation for himself. And he has nobody else to blame but himself only. And he has to live with that. So, moving on. Poor man. It was in honor of this last lesson that he had put on his fine Sunday clothes. And now I understand why the old men of the village were sitting there in the back of the room. It was because they were sorry too that they had not gone to school more. It was their way of thanking our master for his 40 years of faithful service and of showing their respect for the country that was theirs no more. Students, please mark the last sentence. It was their way of thanking our, thanking our master Still, that was there no more. So, two things taking place simultaneously. One is the sense of guilt. Everybody realizes that they have not done their part, they have not done their bit in learning their French language. When there was a chance, they just let it go. They neglected it without realizing what they're letting go. Now, when everybody has come to know that this was the last lesson, this was the last time, M. Hamill was going to deliver a lecture, so everybody wants to attend it. Franz now understands. He had observed things prior to this, prior to the announcement, and now things start registering in his mind. The reason for them attending the class, the reason for M. Hamill wearing the bright clothes, and 
the reason why everybody looked sad why everybody was glum glum faced why there was a, a you know sense of gloom pervading in the classroom in the atmosphere of the classroom why was it so somber this is the reason they have all assembled to pay respect to pay their homage to this great servant of the nation in the last part of the sentence we find m hamel had been offering this dedicated service for 40 long years this talks about the integrity of the teacher the dedication the sincerity and most importantly the deep love for the language that he had harbored so once again the integrity of the teacher his sincerity devotion towards his work and finally we have the love for language so these are basically m hamel's traits or if you are to write a sort of overview of m hamel's character these are the points which you must mention you take it up in such a way that he is no, not just a teacher not just a faithful servant but at the same time an individual who has one side strict taskmaster corporal punishment on the other side is also compassionate he's also a very understanding individual now it definitely moves us to sympathy to to find out what uh, has what, what has what has happened to this fellow what will happen to him 40 years he has dedicated to the service of his nation as a teacher as a lover of the french language now what next is what while i was thinking of all this i heard my name called it was my turn to recite what would i not have given to be able to say the dreadful rule of the participle all through very loud and clear when without one mistake but i got mixed up on the very first words and stood there holding on to my desk my heart beating and not daring to look up it's quite obvious that franz is overwhelmed first he has got bas no basic knowledge about the rules of participle because he has missed those classes he does not know much about it second the humiliation of not being able to answer and third obviously because of that emotional state because of the thing which is going on in his mind he is not in a very very you know a stable state he is emotionally overwhelmed i heard m hamel say to me i won't scold you little franz you must feel bad enough see how it is every day we have said to ourselves bah i have plenty of time i'll learn it tomorrow and now you see where we have come out ah oh, that's the great trouble with alsasha she puts off learning till tomorrow please mark this statement she puts off learning till tomorrow this is the problem with the people of alsasha now here we find one more interesting aspect of m hamel's character we have explored him as a teacher who does his job sincerely with great dedication with great devotion he is a teacher who is very strict at the same time he understands he knows the situation that franz is in he is quick to read the mind of his pupil and instead of reprimanding the child for not being able to answer he just simply persuades him he makes him understand he comes up with such consoling and comforting words which in themselves are very very impactful we don't find him you know using the ruler much over here it's another way of molding the child 
sometimes this aspect of a teacher has to be present. Now, M. Hamill, if you're treating him as a teacher, as an ideal teacher, this aspect should never be missed. He understands the mindset of the students, the kind of emotional state that he is in, and instead of scolding him, tries to make him understand. Not just the student. He gradually moves on to you know, point out the mistake of the people at large. Now, this is not fault finding, mind you. He's not picking out the faults. He's just plainly and simply making them understand where they have gone wrong. The problem with the people of Alsace is that they have put off learning till tomorrow. They have not made the best use of the time at their disposal. They have wasted it, thinking that they have time till tomorrow and that tomorrow never arrives. Unfortunately, because of this lackadaisical attitude, very, very laid back attitude, very careless attitude of the people of, of this province, they're having to pay the price. This is what M. Hamill makes them understand in very simple terms. Not being too authoritative, but being sympathetic. Now those fellows out there will have the right to say to you, how is it you pretend to be Frenchmen and yet you can neither speak nor write your own language? You're not the worst, poor little Franz. We have all a great deal to reproach ourselves with. Second thing that he does is, he does not put the entire blame on little Franz. He tries to make it very simple that all the people share the same responsibility. And then, in the next few lines, he talks about his own responsibility as well. Your parents were not anxious enough to have you learn. They preferred to put you to work on a farm or at the mills so as to have a little more money. And I, I have been to blame also. Have I not often sent you to water my flowers instead of learning your own lessons? And when I wanted to go fishing, did I not just give you a holiday? So the third thing that he does is, he shares some part of the blame. Even he has given a holiday. Even he has uh, stopped classes, right, for his own motives. So the unsatisfactory progress of the students, he takes some part of the responsibility as well. Instead of putting the entire blame on the students. One more hallmark of a great teacher who has this sort of understanding. Moving on, he says, then from one thing to another, M. Hamel went on to talk of the French language, saying that it was the most beautiful language in the world. The clearest, the most logical, that we must guard it among us and never forget it. Because when a people are enslaved, as long as they hold on fast to their language, it is as if they had the key to their prison. Then he opened a grammar and read out a lesson. I was amazed to see how well I understood. And he said, seemed so easy. All he said seemed so easy, so very easy. I think too that I had never listened so carefully and that he had never explained everything with so much patience. The things to underline over here are the way M. Hamel speaks so passionately about French being the clearest language, the most logical language. It expresses his deep love for language. Second, he talks about how language can act as a very, very potent means of resistance. When a people are enslaved, like the French people are, when they are being subjugated, the only way possible for them to come out to break free from the shackles of oppression is to continue practicing their native language. Language acts as a unifying force, bringing people together, giving them something to hold on to. Even in the times of such a crisis, it's one common factor, one commonality which binds people together. Second, it can, if we continue practicing language like this, it will definitely resist the intention of the masters to impose their language on the natives. Third, since the practice of native language is necessary to learn one's, uh, to, to know something about one's culture, one's roots, it helps you preserve the cultural identity. 
preserve the cultural identity. Language acts as a unifying force, bringing people together. And third, I'll just switch over here. It fosters a spirit of nationalism. And that is exactly what M. Hamill had been trying to do to instill a deep love for the French language in the students, which will help them to have this strong patriotic fervor. They already know that their country is under foreign rule. Even in these times, if they can hold on to their culture, if they can preserve it, they perhaps have a chance of preserving their national identity, redeeming themselves from this situation. After the grammar, we had a lesson in writing. The day M. Hamel had new copies for us, written in a beautiful round hand. France, Elsace, France, Elsace. They looked like little flags floating everywhere in the schoolroom, hung from the rod at the top of our desks. You ought to have seen how everyone set to work. Please mark this. How everyone set to work and how quiet it was. The only sound was the scratching of the pens over the paper. Once, some beetles flew in. But nobody paid attention to them, not even the littlest ones who worked right on tracing their fish hooks as if that was French too. On the roof, the pigeons cooed very low, and I thought to myself, will they make them sing in Germans, German, even the pigeons? Please mark this last statement, this question. The situation of the classroom, everybody was doing their work with so much intensity, so much attention, so much eagerness. Everybody was quiet. Everybody was engrossed in their work. And M. Hamill should get the credit for creating that kind of ambience, that kind of atmosphere, which will help trigger that feeling of patriotism in those kids, in those uh, children and the adults. So on hearing the pigeons, Franz makes a sarcastic remark. Will the Germans Make, them, make the pigeons coo in German. Now, cooing is the most natural form of expression for the pigeons, as is the native language for the French people. So cooing, the French should come as naturally to the, these people as cooing comes to the pigeons, right? You can sense this kind of exasperation, the outrage, the anger, the dis the hatred which the, which the French people have harbored against the Germans. So through this question, Franz raises a question about, about the legitimacy. How far is it correct? How far is it right to impose one's language over the conquered? Germans were trying to do that. They're imposing their language on the French. And Franz you know, questions the legitimacy of this aggressive intent of trying to completely wipe out and obliterate the existence of a race by preventing them from practicing their native language. This is a very, very unethical and immoral act. Something that immediately calls for an outburst. It's a natural outburst which will take place. Franz, being a little kid, understands and he expresses, he becomes a spokesperson of the entire community, entire race. That anger is felt. Whenever I looked up from my writing, I saw M. Hamill sitting motionless in his chair and gazing first at one thing, then at another, as if he wanted to fix in his mind just how everything looked in that little school room. Fancy, for 40 years he had been there in the same place with his garden outside and the window in his class in front of him. Just like that. Only the desks and benches had been worn smooth. The walnut trees in the garden were taller and the hop vine that he had planted himself twined about the windows to the roof. How it must have broken his heart to leave it all. Poor man. To hear his sister moving about in the room above, packing their trunks for they must leave the country the next day. At this point of time, M. Hamill is completely distraught. You know, 
a man who had spent 40 years of his life doing the same thing, overnight he has to leave that place. So what we are hinting at is the emotional attachment which M. Hamill has had with this little place. But he had the courage to hear every lesson to the very last. After the writing, we had a lesson on history, and then the babies chanted their ba be bi bo boo Down there at the back of the room, old Hosser had put on his spectacles and holding his primer in both hands, spelled the letters with them. You could see that he too was crying. His voice trembled with emotion and that it was so funny to hear him that we all wanted to laugh and cry. Ah, oh, how well I remember the last lesson. So this was the last lesson. And he remembers it very, very clearly, very vivid memories of the last lesson. Uh, it was a very emotionally charged moment, and the classroom was a very, had a somber atmosphere. Even when old Hosser was reciting the lines, he got choked. He could not speak. We wanted to laugh and wanted to cry at the same time. This is what shows how everybody had been affected. All at once, the church clock struck 12, then the Angelus. At the same moment, the trumpets of the Prussians returning from drill sounded under our windows. Now, this is quite symbolic. It marks the end of the lesson. The Prussians coming, which means the Germans have taken over, and the next day onwards, French lesson will stop forever. M. Hamel stood up, very pale in his chair. I never saw him look so tall. He looks quite dignified. In spite of being so very emotional, overwhelmed by emotion, he maintains his composure, maintains his calmness, and speaks in a very, very dignified manner. He does not break down in front of everyone. My friends, said he, I, I, but something choked him. He could not go on. Then he turned to the blackboard, took a piece of chalk, and bearing on with all his might, he wrote as large as he could, Vive la France, long live France. Then he stopped and learned, leaned his head against the wall, and without a word, he made a gesture to us with his hand. School is dismissed. You may go. Now this brings us to the end of the lesson. It's a very poignant end, very emotionally charged moment when you can all understand how everybody is affected by one factor. That is the foreign aggression. A quick recap of all the things. The entire chapter, entire story therefore deals with the predicament of a conquered nation, a conquered race who are deprived of the right to use their own native language. We talk about the linguistic chauvinism of the Germans and how it had a very negative effect on the psyche, on the psychological uh, condition of the French people. The victims of cultural subjugation. The deep love for language which M. Hamill tried to foster within these people, which would act as a catalyst to trigger up the patriotic fervor. Second, preservation of the cultural identity through extensive practice of native language to resist the cultural oppression and how language can become a unifying force and bring people together under the same banner, infusing in them the same spirit of nationalism. Last but not the least, we have already talked about the qualities of M. Hamill as a teacher and as an ideal teacher and how he helps these young minds, shapes them, influences them to take the fight forward. With that, students, we have come to the end of this video lecture. With that, I would like to end and hope you have understood. If you have any queries, feel free to contact any teacher. and. Uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening.